All right. Well, happy Friday, everyone. I'm so, so grateful to be able to, to present this morning. Thank you so much to, to Ed and Kyle for organizing um, this CEU opportunity. And today we're going to discuss the ABCs of pest control. And I actually work for ABC, so it's it's very, very fitting for the topic. So as we look at the, the ABCs of, of pest control, um, looking at the, the um, how we're, we're going to control these animals and, and what is the, the perception of, of controlling these animals, I'm experiencing some, some technical difficulties. There we go. So when we look at, at our business model, so business model, we always start off with, with a very strong leader and we are very blessed within our organization to have such a, a tremendous leader and Mr. Bobby Jenkins and um, the whole crew within our company. So to have that leadership, to, to be able to move on and um, grow our business on an annual basis. Basis, we not only are able to do pest control within our organization, but we've branched off into other businesses um, such as plumbing and HVAC and, and our business model just keeps keeps continuing to grow because of the foresight and our leadership. And then the internal support. So whether that be a customer service representative or a service manager or supervisors all working together, and that way we can support one another. And we have a really good basis, especially when we have those new technicians that, that join our organization. And then the role as pest management professionals. Sometimes I get the, the question, Kim, I need I need a fumigation, um, and that is not the the case. So just the the lack of knowledge from our customer basis and how we represent to the best of our ability, the professional side of pest management, that we are doing a thorough inspection and we're identifying these pests and then we're solving the pest problem in conjunction with that customer. And then looking at those six principles of, of IPM. So we'll go through each one of those principles and then, of course, the, the summary at the end of the presentation. So that's how this hour is, is going to work. Um, looking at our, our leader. So our leader is Bobby Jenkins within our company, um, aka Boss Man. And our purpose as a company is to enhance the quality of life of our customers by making their environment healthier and safer, more comfortable and more enjoyable. So that is what we strive for. We strive to make sure that the customer um, is in direct communication with with the sales inspectors, with our, our supervisors, our technicians, with our technical teams, our auditors, and that way we're able to solve those pest problems together. So without strong leadership, sometimes things go sideways. And so very grateful for the leadership that, that um, Bobby puts into the company, the time he puts into the company and effort that he puts into the company. And one of our taglines, as a company is specialist for your environment. So that couldn't be even more fitting for, for integrated pest management and developing those pest specific strategies. So we can't go in treating silverfish like we would bed bugs. So we have to make sure that we have set protocols Everyone within the company is aware of those protocols. We do have a website in which we post our protocols. Um, everyone's going to be able to look at them via our customer basis or our field technicians, our supervisors, and that way everybody's on the same page. And this ultimately is a comprehensive approach in order to reduce pesticide usage. So we're definitely not a, a spray or pray and spray Um industry, we have to make sure that, that we design those best specific strategies. And that way we truly get those good results. And we are doing our job both environmentally as well as taking care of the customer and, and solving the root of the problem. We do have a, a quality assurance team within our company. And this is just for our pest side. So our pest side of the, the company for both residential and commercial 
special, and they double check our work. So the job of these six individuals is to cover territory from Central Texas down into South Texas. So putting that in a drive perspective, that can be a six to eight hour drive one way, depending on traffic. So they have a very large job, a large territory, but they are very diligent. Um, they are going with our new hires when they start, making sure that they are confident and ready to, to go out in the, the field. They are also checking in um, at 30 days, at 60 days, 90 days. They do ride along audits. They're doing site audits. They're doing ticket audits. And these are random audits. So our field specialists do not get notification. It's just randomly pulled. And then their score is a factor for the technician's uh, monthly bonus. So it is on that technician to make sure that, that they are filling out all of the work orders correctly, that they're doing everything that, that they should protocol wise. And if they have any issues that, that they are getting those fixed. Otherwise our auditors are going to find them and they could give them a, a you know, a poor score. And then that's going to reflect in their bonus. We also try to hire individuals that are going to stay with us. And this, this industry, there's there's a high turnover. Unfortunately, I went to a, a conference last year and, and the statistics from that business showed that if somebody stays for a year and a day, they're more likely to, to stay for five years after that. So if they stay, you know, just um, if they aren't interested within the first couple of months, they're not going to make it over a year. So we try to, to give those individuals um, a heads up about the industry before they even start. So we have a recruiter that talks to them. We have a service manager that talks to them over the phone and describes the ins and outs of the job. And then that individual is brought into the office. They talk to the service manager, um, talk to the operations manager, and then they go and shadow somebody out in the field. And this has worked really well for us to, to make sure that these individuals know exactly what they're getting into, what they're signing up for, um, the amount of time for training. We do seven weeks of training, one day in classroom, four days out in the field. And then we have our auditors go with the, the new hires, just making sure that, that everything's good to go. They're confident. Um, we try to, to make sure that their trucks are, are good. They're quick is fully functional. They have everything that they need on day one. And then that's where the auditors come into play. If something is, is astray, then they'll be able to fill in those gaps and, and get that individual up to speed, or we might need to, to lengthen the amount of training. This is one of our auditors. And um, the first thing that they do, if the specialist is not there, if they're going to do a site audit, is pop the camper doors or pop the, the door door handles to see if anything's unlocked. In the state of Texas, that's what our inspectors are going to do. The state inspectors are going to make sure that everything is secured. If it's not secured, that's when those fines are going to go into place. So this specialist had no idea he was going to be audited that morning. And our auditor went out there and sure enough, his cab door was open. His keys were in the vehicle. And so our auditor moved his vehicle. So moved it down the street and then went back to his own vehicle and just waited for the the service technician to to come back out of the home and the service technician was was very puzzled as to what what the world happened to his vehicle could have been stolen so um having these auditors having our field auditors it helps us to stay accountable and and that's what's needed for the state audits as well as for our customers and and for our environment so looking at these arthropods um this this slide always gives us job security. So to give put it in perspective of 59% of our insects, 7% are going to be our arthropods. Um, and then we're lumped into that 13% of other animals on, on the planet. So a lot of arthropods out there, um, they do rule the world. We're just there to reduce the amount and the reduce the amount that could medically harm us or, or cause structural damage. But at the end of the day, 
they're they're going to to be good. And the important thing about identification. So I threw in that picture of the tiger beetle, um, a very important predator. So that's what we have to explain to our customers that not everything that's moving around, crawling around needs to to be killed. It took me about five years coming in from extension to recognize that we're in customer service. So of course, if our customers feel like it's a pest um, and within reason, we're going to be able to control that they're, you know, we're going to have those native ant species and we're going to have um, some beetles and some predatory flies that deserve to, to live. So with successful IPM programs always starts with that inspection and identification. So once we know what pest we're dealing with, then we can design that treatment program and we'll be able to identify all those conditions that are, are suitable for that population to survive and to grow. And then we can start to reduce food sources. We can start to reduce water sources and habitat. And long term, we're going to be able to reduce those pest problems. So in the picture, looking at that moisture damaged wood, looking at the oils from the rodents to customers, they probably would just brush it off and say, that's my back porch. But it's our responsibility to point out all of those con conducive conditions. With IPM, looking at that that first step of those six steps, inspection. So inspection, um, we need to take our time. We need to do a, a thorough look around both inside that building as well as outside of that building. We need to have our mirror. We need to, to be able to take out drawers, open up doors, and really take a look at that property. We can't just walk around and shine our phone flashlight at the ceiling and get a good indicator of what is going on at that property. We have to take our time and be super thorough with that inspection. So looking for those conducive conditions, looking for pest activity, we need to have that bright working flashlight um, with that rechargeable battery, making sure that it is charged. We need to have that inspection mirror. We need to be able to have a ladder, um, maybe if we need to look at the roof, um, and then some flushing agents. So if we have some of the aerosols to be able to flush those animals out of hiding, and Dr. Don Renchi, who's with Texas AgriLife Extension, always talks about head down and butt up. Um, so we need to get on our knees, have those knee pads, um, and be able to, to get at ground level, look underneath the kitchen table, look underneath that counter. Um, those pests are not just going to say, here, I'm I'm hiding over here. We have to go and look for them. So head down, butt up when we're doing that inspection. So looking at, at this video of German cockroaches, had we not opened up the, the cabinet door, opened up the drawers, we would have no indication of how many German cockroaches were living in those, those kitchen cabinetry. So we want to make sure that, that we're always taking the time to do that thorough inspection and, and making sure that, that we are finding all of those pests that could be hiding in as well as around that building. And then we're always detectives. So looking at these carpenter ants on the, the water hose, we're finding as we trace them back and looking at that trail that they're actually nesting within that moisture damaged wood. So had we not gone back and, and found those ants trailing, we would have never have realized that that area around the door frame needs to be replaced because it's damaged by that wood and makes it easy for those carpenter ants to work and colonize within that wood. We also look around the property and we see some overhanging tree branches. Now we might have a parent colony of those carpenter ants in that tree and those tree limbs. And so it's a great idea to trim back those tree limbs. And that way we don't have um, that 
that population of carp and durants being able to reinvade that building. So in that inspection process, outside looking for trees touching the, the structure, looking for overgrown ornamental plants. So this was an account in Austin in which the customer liked the look of this ivy more than they did the brick. So this becomes a forever customer to us because not only are they going to have ants, they're going to have cockroaches, they're going to have termites, they're going to have rodents. Um, so most of the time, our customers don't realize what they're doing when um, it might be aesthetically pleasing, but for functionality, they're just inviting a whole bunch of pests. So educating them about the overgrown ornamental plants is, is key in the pest reduction, as well as we can check for cracks in the foundation. Um, if something has shift, that's going to allow termites to go inside, some ants to be able to go inside, and then entry points around the eaves, around the crawl spaces. We need to, to pay attention to those when we're doing our inspection and to go into the crawl spaces, to go into that attic space. And then sometimes accounts will change overnight. So this was an account um, in which it was sold by the sales inspector for fleas. At the time of the sale, the homeowner had removed the cats. They had removed that that small pool, all of those geese, all of the, the ducks were not on property. But when the service was scheduled and the technician went out, all of a sudden these animals are there and um, were not able to do the 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 treatment at that time, nor do we do we want to get started. So if customers are are inviting these animals that we know have fleas and ticks, and it's going to be a, a constant reoccurring issue. So maybe we want to step back. Maybe it's not the, the customer for us. I went to, to one account in which the customer kept uh, uh, saying that she had fleas over and over and over again, and she wasn't doing anything. She didn't have any animals. She wasn't feeding the the neighborhood cats or dogs. And we just kept going back. And, and finally, I showed up 10 minutes earlier than that set appointment. And I knocked on her door just to see if I could get started with that inspection. And she looked at me very panicked and said, you're not supposed to be here for another 10 minutes. And so she did let me into the, the backyard and she, sure enough, she had set up water bowls, she had food bowls. Um, so she was feeding the neighborhood feral animals and then not being honest with us about that. So showing up a little bit earlier, she she was very um, thrown off that that she wasn't able to remove all of the said water and, and food and and we kind of figured out that we need to part ways. We're not going to gain control of that flea population. And then even though we have sales inspectors go out for something like rodents to give our customers a proposal, sometimes they're not going onto the roof. So what might look like a small little hole um, when you're standing on the ground is going to be a big gaping area when we go on that ladder. So very important to use that ladder to go onto the roof to be able to see the, the roof structure. In situations like this, we're going to have to refund the customer. So there's no way to wrap all of the barrel tile with some hardware cloth or some flashing. So we're going to have to refund the, the customer their money. And then with this one, we have the the you no know, window panes on those windows. We also have bars on the windows. So this was sold as an exclusion and the inspector felt like we could just put some some metal flashing in those areas and, and we would figure it out. Um, so it was sold as an exclusion for rats. There's no way for us to, to be successful at that account um, without those windows being replaced, the frames of the windows being replaced as well as around the the eaves there's too many entry points so we can't we can't get started and then inside, so we might have a situation such as this and in, in which the customer had bed bugs um, but did not have functional plumbing. Um, we in our our treatment for bed bugs as a company, we use a heat treatment and we elevate the temperature to 135 degrees. And we can't um 
do that service unless the the plumbing is functional. So we do have a within our organization, we do have a plumbing department. So our plumbers were able to go out there, get all of the sinks, the toilets, the tubs working again, and then we we're able to go out and do our heat treatment for bed bugs. So the second part of that IPM program is going to be identification. So identification is going to be very important to know what pest we're dealing with. Um, we have an email address within our company for field technicians and customers to be able to send pictures to for identification. But if they're sending pictures such as these two, we won't be able to identify. So if somebody's sending pictures in at um, six feet away or putting those animals in a water bottle as they did here or in a plastic sandwich bag, we're not going to be able to see those clear characteristics. So we do need to have very nice focus pictures, multiple angles. We might have to have those smaller specimens brought into the office. We do have microscopes at our office. Our phones are able to magnify those animals and we can get some really good quality uh, photos from our phones if we take our time. We can also use a, a jeweler's loop in order to magnify. NPMA has a really nice um, app to be able to identify these animals. In Texas, we have about 30,000 different insects. Um, and so we we have quite, quite the diversity here. So it, it's good to, to be able to have a centralized email address in which those photos can come in and then we can get that information back to our field technicians, back to our customers. We're also blessed in the fact that we have ACEs, we have BCEs on staff um, to be able to identify those animals. Um, having our advancement program within our, our technician basis, the end goal is for all of our technicians to become ACEs. So our company does pay for our technicians at the end of that advancement program to become ACEs. And that's going to be a leaps and bounds of help for our company. So the, the more that we know, the more that we can share with one another, as well as to our customers. And then looking at some of these animals that that are not going to be covered under general pest control. Very helpful to not overextend that agreement. So with our general pest control agreement, we have certain pests that are covered and then others are not going to be covered. So in Texas, we have our own leaf cutter ant um, at a Texana and it is really, really cool to look in the park. I love watching these leaf cutter ants in the park as I'm taking my dog for a walk. Not so cool when they're on your own property. So having these leaf cutters, being able to take those leaves, bits and pieces of leaves, and then more importantly, excavate the soil. So with this leaf cutter ant, um, the treatment is very intensive and it involves us going out each and every month indefinitely. So we don't want to get started and then have that um, within our, our workload. We want to be upfront with our customers, let them know that our leaf cutters are not covered and that we can treat for them. It's just going to be an additional charge. This is a video of leaf cutters that have now excavated underneath a home and they've made their way into that center wall. So the customers were probably okay with those leaf cutter ants out out in the yard, but now that they're in the kitchen, it becomes a different story. So we're able to trench and treat for those leaf cutters around that, that home um, and then eventually gain control of those leaf cutters. So they stop excavating so much soil from underneath that, that home and invading those walls, but they're still going to be found on property. And then with our tawny crazy ants, um, that is also an ant that is not covered with general pest control. It is a tramp ant. It's brought in usually through turf grass or soil or mulch that is not inspected and then just placed into the landscape. These tawny crazy ants do not sting, but they are an annoyance and they can group together with those electrical surge 
rockets and they have shut down NASA um, as one example just because of the sheer numbers. So if this ant does not come in co contact with those chemicals, um, I've seen uh, those ants and, and populations outside of the Houston area in the billions. So it looks like you're going into a science fiction movie set, but it's real life and it's just covered with these ants. So really, really big nuisance ants that were accidentally brought in. And so since they do have large populations, it does take multiple services to go out there, customers to be diligent about blowing off those dead carcasses. That way, the live ants are able to cross over that chemical threshold. And then with our southern yellow jackets, we do have several stings that occur each and every summer. Um, there are at least 20,000, if not more, potentially underneath the ground, a few that are just hovering around. And with our lawn maintenance crews, they are stung, unfortunately, with those weed eaters, those riding lawn mowers, someone that has maybe some AirPods in that's just doing the service. It's Friday afternoon, and then all of a sudden they're zapped with these southern yellow jackets. And that's not going to be a covered pest within our our program. So it does involve an additional charge as well as additional PPE. So we can't afford to have those single wasps with that smooth stinger sting our service specialist. So we we'll want to make sure that they are well protected, that they have that bee suit, um, that it fits them, that um, there are no gaps in between that veil and the neck, and there's tight fitting arms and legs and before they go out. So our next next step um, is going to be analysis. So we're figuring out why those pests are in existence. So why, why are they choosing to live in that area? Is there too much moisture? Is there not enough moisture? Is there a lot of food in that area? So with our, our, um, our turf grass, um, having very minimal water, we're, we're at 75, do, 75 days and counting of triple digit weather in the state of Texas and, and things are drying up like I've never, never experienced before. But when our customers see what looks to them like fire ants, um, they give us a call and we go out there and we realize it's not ants at all. It's actually castings from earthworms. So we need to explain to our customers that not all piles of soil are going to be indicative of ants. Um, we do have those earthworm castings. Looking at some facts about earthworms, the one earthworm can digest 36 tons of soil. We need those mineral rich castings within our soil. So if customers do see these earthworm castings, just to hand water, turn on the irrigation system, making sure that all of those minerals are going back into the soil and we have a healthy root systems for all of our plants. Another one that we frequently get calls about are galls. So we have different arthropods that are going to lay their eggs inside of new growth of leaves or stems. And then the reaction of the plant is to grow around that arthropod egg. So there isn't a need for chemical control. If the customer thinks it's unsightly, they can just go ahead and, and trim that branch or take off some of those leaves if they think that it is unsightly. But it's part of part of the, the life cycle and, and part of our, our world and our ecosystem to, to have these gall formers because we have them developing for that next generation within that gall. Our next uh, step is going to be selecting our treatment combination. So we always want to have those cultural controls in conjunction with our mechanical, our physical, those biologicals, those good guys that, that we want to let live, and then what chemicals that we're going to use. And within that, that IPM program, we always want to use those chemicals that are going to have that caution signal word first um, and make sure that we're rotating those 
chemical classes. So looking at sanitation um, modifications in order to reduce or avoid those pest problems. So how often is the customer actually vacuuming? How often are they cleaning their dishes? How often are they taking out trash? How often are they cleaning the dumpster, cleaning out those trash cans? And then outdoors, what type of plants are they planting? Are they fertilizing them? Are they watering them um, with our lack of water? Now we're under water restriction. So in some parts of the state, we can't use irrigation. And so that is really, really stressful on those outdoor plants. We had, um, or we still, it's still an account in, um, in Texas and, and this prominent seafood restaurant. And, and this was the back of the property. And you can see how much trash was, was just out in the open. We had containers of used cooking oil that were out and about. Um, they had the oyster shells just in those plastic crates. And then take a look of where that that next morning's delivery was housed. And so these uh, this customer, before we started, they did have a severe rodent issue. They had a severe um, cockroach issue. It was along the coast. They also had a lot of different ant species. So until we educate our customers of schedule a delivery time, that way it's not just sitting out there um, with those other pests, they, they didn't think about it. So they, they were having those rodents go and feed on the, the new food that was delivered. And um, now we have them or they're taking those steps to, to remove all of the trash on a more regular basis. They're closing that cooking oil, disposing of it on a nightly basis. They're not leaving those shells out any longer. And then they have those scheduled times to where somebody can pop open that back door and take in that delivery versus just having it sit outdoors. And then with our their standing water, um, in this account, the customer knew that their pool pump was not functioning, but still chose to have that, that pool filled with water. And it wasn't until we had this video and showed the customer with our flashlight how many mosquito larvae were found within that pool, they wouldn't have drained that pool. So anything that is a... a a water bottle lid or larger full of water is going to be breeding grounds for those mosquitoes. So when we look at that standing water, we have to point out all of those conducive conditions. And that way the customer can make that choice of either fixing the, the pump or um, draining that pool. And that way they don't have all of that standing water for those mosquitoes to breed in. And then we do encourage our, our field technicians to take videos, take pictures of those accounts, especially if they see other chemicals that the customer might have purchased. Um, of course, with the videos, with the photos, we don't want pictures of the actual customer or their dogs or their children or any personal belongings, but actually of that job site. So that's what this video is um, showing the conditions. This customer had German cockroaches, but then they also had all of these dishes, all this food that was out and about, and then had that can of Raid, right? next to the stove top. So we, we do encourage those videos to be taken, um, those photos to be taken, and that way they can be placed into the customer's account in case there's any questions from the customer, the service manager, that we have a record of, of what that account did look like. Um, within this video, looking at forward flies, so drains um, where at a restaurant in which the customer formally was putting French fries and sandwiches into the drain, not realizing that it's not a garbage disposal and it's just sitting there and that's going to be fly breeding grounds as well as within the grout, um, those drain lines underneath the appliances. So a nice harborage area for the flies that, that needs to be cleaned up. And then building materials outside. So this customer had building materials that conduit out there for years and never thought about moving it. They just stacked more on top, not realizing that's where all the rodents were living. That's where the cockroaches were living. The ants were living. So decreasing the amount of clutter both inside and outside is going to greatly reduce that pest population. 
with springtail. So even though it is really, really hot in Texas right now, um, there are some people that are still watering a little illegally. And um, we're finding that maybe those irrigation heads are not working properly, too much moisture, and now we have springtails. So with the um, cooperation of our customers and the educating portion of our job to reduce the amount of moisture, and that's ultimately going to reduce that springtail population. And then looking at our plant varieties, I know in other states working with university systems to figure out what's best going to grow in those particular states. So we can't expect in Texas for somebody to bring um, a plant from Idaho and, and successfully possibly grow it in Texas. So we want to have some of those those vetted plants that that are going to be able to survive in desert like conditions, especially in our state. Otherwise, they're going to become stressed and they're going to attract all of those insect species. With mechanical control, so that's going to be something that we're going to use in conjunction with our customers' cooperation, is the use of labor and materials and machinery. So we can actually hand pick those caterpillars. We can use high force water sprays to spray off aphids or white flies. We can use barriers. We can use screens. We can use trapping devices. Um, this picture was sent in. We had a customer that felt like they. They were going to take care of the armadillos on their own. They put some plastic forks into the ground, and they thought that as the armadillos were uprooting those flowering plants, that would, they would get poked by the, the plastic forks, and they would back off and go into another property. Of course, we know that this isn't going to work. Um, what is going to work is to get rid of the armadillo's food source, so to control those grubs, um, and then that way the armadillos don't want to be on that property because they no longer have have that food source. With the mechanical control options of caulking and sealing, when we're making those suggestions, we always want to confirm with the customer that they have purchased the correct product. With caulking, it's going to be a flexible material. So that's what we want to go around those window cells, around those door frames um, to prevent the entry of those smaller pests versus sealing. Sealants are going to be coating or protecting of a surface. So we really want to make sure that our customers are purchasing the right materials before they place them in and around their home. And then we do have metal hardware cloth that we can seal off vents. If our customers are saving rainwater, I want to make sure that that screen is intact. Um, we use some copper mesh to put into weep holes. That way it's going to cut into the waxy layer of the animal's body and that way they're going to dry out and they are going to die. And then looking at the seals around the doors, um, whether that be garage doors or side doors, front doors, making sure that we don't see any gaps. Um, and if we do, that, that we are reinstalling that gasket. And then chimney caps to prevent those birds and raccoons and squirrels from entering. And then with our snap traps, that's going to be considered the, the most humane way of killing those rats as well as those mice. We want to put them in areas in which we, um, our customers are not going to come in contact with them. Pets are not going to come in contact with them. If we do put them in indoor living spaces, that we put an out, outer box over them. And then live cages to, to make sure that we, we have those cages always kept horizontally and that we are relocating that animal. We try to stay five miles from that catchment site and relocate them where there's a water source as well as a tree line. So it's best to stay in close vicinity of, of catchment and that way they're best able to survive. And we never want to have those cages vertically. We had that occur um, in our, our South Texas office in which the customer was outside and we didn't have those cages horizontal. We had them vertical and those raccoons just popped out of the cage and went and climbed up the tree. So we want to always keep those cages horizontal. And then these animals are smart. So sometimes we have to install game cams. If they're not going into our cages, we, we have to get on their level and, and make sure that, that we're setting up those cages in our appropriate sites. 
With light traps, those are going to be important to identify what type of flying pests are at that account. We have smaller units that we're able to sell to residential properties. And then these larger units are for our commercial properties. So we go and service those, making sure that the, the um, glue board behind the light is changed out and then making sure that the light bulb is working. Otherwise, it, that trapping device is not going to work. Our HEPA filter vacuum is important when we're sucking up those German cockroaches, um, when we're moving those cases for our case making clothes moss, and then having that disposable bag inside of that vacuum is helpful. That way we can just pop the bag out, seal it with tape, and then dispose of that bag with our physical control. So now we're altering the amount of light and humidity and temperature. So maybe we want to free up some air. That way the fungal spores are not leaning Standing onto that plant material. We want to give more sunlight to the turf grass. That way it's not so stressed out. So those will be our physical controls. The biggest physical control that we use are going to be for bed bugs. And we use this salamander in order to heat up structures above 135 degrees, hold it there for three hours to cook all of those life stages of our bed bugs, cook all of those life stages of our case making clothes moss. Of course, at this temperature, there can be some damage. So that's why we have to be mindful of those items to be treated. We do have a prep sheet for our customers, making sure that they are prepped before the job, as well as that we are not liable for any issues post heat. So those salamanders are going to be fueled. The heaters are going to be fueled on propane as well as electricity. They stay outside. And then we have this very flexible duct that takes in the heat into those buildings. So we can go multiple stories. We'll be able to get that duck inside, get that heat circulated. We do have specialized team members, specialized um, technicians to do our heat work. They also double up and do our fumigation work. So when we do a heat treatment, it's not turning on the heater. It's not popping open the windows. It is bringing in the heat and then circulating the heat and going in every 15 to 20 minutes and flipping furniture, taking blankets out of the closet, taking clothes, coats out of the closet. So we do high force fans in order to force the heat into the walls, into the flooring, into the furniture. And this process this takes about eight hours to complete on average. So setting up the equipment, bringing up the heat, um, and then packing up all the equipment, it's about eight hours. So Alan Brown, um, who is also a board certified entomologist within our company, did this video uh, using a temperature probe. So we know that heat's going to kill those bed bugs at 122 degrees, um, as evident by multiple papers. But in order in a real life setting, we bump it up a few degrees to account for the absorption of heat within all of the, the walls, within the flooring, and that way we get a better kill. And then it's not too hot to where we're causing a lot of damage structurally. This video was taken at a senior living facility, and um, this individual living within the room had been living with bed bugs for quite some time, but wasn't physically able to move the box spring and the, the mattress to really take a look, had pretty poor eyesight and was taking multiple medicines. So every time the bed bugs would feed, he wouldn't have a reaction. So not until there was new management at this facility that they started doing monthly inspections and realize that a lot of their residents were living with high populations of these bed bugs. So unfortunately, you know, sometimes they do go unnoticed because of eyesight, because of lack of reaction or physically not being able to move and, and do a thorough inspection. And then with case making clothes moss. So this is truly my my nemesis insect on the planet um, for now. With these case making clothes moths, they can go from egg stage to an adult in as little as two months, or it can take them seven years. So 
when we apply chemical alone, it, it sometimes it's not going to be effective depending on the population level. So I'm thankful that we're able to have a heat option once these moths have traveled to multiple floors, multiple rooms, we're going to be able to take care of them using our heat treatment. And then we follow it up with a chemical residual a couple of days later, along with some pheromone traps, making sure that we have eliminated that case making closed moth population and then educate our customers about not bringing them back in to dry clean to have those rugs cleaned before they're placed back into that property with our predators our good guys the ones that we want to keep alive um they're going to be very strong they're going to attack that live prey we have those examples of our praying mantids our spiders our scorpions so they're going to be really good guys to to keep alive we also also have our cool parasitic wasp and flies that are going to choose to lay her eggs in certain insects and then their eggs are going to hatch and they're going to develop within those insects. So I think that's how they got the concept of alien um, through looking at the, the life cycle of these parasitoids. So what's in that video is the pincher wasp larvae that was developing inside of the sample that was brought into the office of that leaf hopper and then we have a specific wasp that's going to lay her eggs into that case making clothes moss. Of course, we can't just release 10,000 wasps at an account, but knowing that they're out there, that they're helping us to reduce the pest population, being able to recognize them and educate our customers, knowing that they're there for a purpose. With those pathogens, they're going to be our fungal spores, our, our bacteria, our, our nematodes. They're going to help us out. One that we use pretty frequently for mosquitoes is going to be that BTI within the mosquito dunks. Um, so we can put this BTI into standing water, and then we know that those mosquito larvae are going to be tricked. They're going to feed on that Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis, and then it's going to cause digestive issues, and those mosquito larvae are going to die. Looking at those products that are least toxic, we always want to select those products that have that caution signal word. We want to rotate those chemistries. That way we have multiple um, modes of action and we don't have resistance occur. With our bait stations, we never know what we're going to find whenever we open those bait stations. This video, a whole bunch of roof rats coming out of that bait station. So we know um, that they're enjoying that rodenticide, but they need to go at least every other month to check those bait stations and be able to rotate out that rodenticide. And then in the case of hoarders, so with hoarders, um, they're, they're usually a, a a special, special type of customer. Um, we do have those hoarders that that might have case making clothes moss or might have bed bugs. In those situations, it wouldn't be feasible for us to do a heat treatment. So we have an option of doing fumigation. So our specialized technicians that do heat treatments also double up and do the fumigations. And that way we're able to pump in that deadly gas and be able to kill those bed bugs. So we can do a tarp fumigation. We can also do a tape and seal in which those doors and those windows from the outside are going to be sealed with plastic as well as tape. Tape ducts work inside and that way we can get the gas in. Very, very specialized process um, and special service within the, the state of Texas and special licensing and credentials to be able to do this work. And then with that fifth step of monitoring, we always want to monitor putting out those glue boards, being able to receive those, those text messages from our customers, um, calls from customers to let us know what they've seen, how that population is decreasing, um, especially with those nocturnal animals, such as what's pictured on the top, our brown recluse spiders, our bark scorpions. Um, if we're going in at 10 a.m., we're not getting a true read. So having these monitoring devices, having these glue boards is a super good indicator of what's still moving around and crawling around and to know that the customer is not over-exaggerating, that there is a lot of the those pests still roaming around and what else can we do? And then documentation. So we always have to document um, exactly what we saw, um, what we use both inside and outside, all of those pesticides, all of those devices. And thankfully, we no longer have a paper trail. We have every 
everything electronically. Um, our customers are receiving a work order. They're also receiving pictures. So our service specialists take pictures of all those conducive conditions, and then they provide them an audio file that's personalized per account of what they found, where they treated, and their suggestions. So this has come a long way um, in for our customers to be supported, that they know exactly what we treated for, why, and then how to prevent those reinfestations or to reduce the amount of, of habitats in that area. So with that, that's the end of, of my presentation. I, I hope that everyone has a, a great Friday and even better weekend. Great presentation. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you, Kim.